As gardeners and plant parents, we are always looking for ways to care for our plants, but we can also stop and think about how our plants can care for us. There are so many edible plants that offer medicinal properties to us humans, and many of us don't partake in this offering simply because we might not know how to. It could be intimidating. I know for me, the field of herbalism has been extremely intimidating and frankly has a whole separate vocabulary. But if you start small, like with a homemade tea, something we talk about in today's episode, and slowly grow your knowledge, there is a world of wellness at our fingertips within our gardens. I myself am a total newbie and sought out a true expert to gently introduce us to this topic, and she'll have you running to your herb garden at the end of this episode to see what you can whip up. So welcome to this healing conversation. Bloom and grow radio. Hello, hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. As I record this, I'm still in Florida. I'm having such a beautiful time soaking up the warm weather, spending lots of time with Mama Faella. I hope you enjoyed her episode that aired a couple weeks ago. By the time this episode airs, we're back in New York, approaching the holiday season. I hope your shopping is done for the holidays. Quick welcome to our newest members of the Garden Party platform and app, Miranda M. and Amy P. For those of you that don't know, we have an app for iOS and Android exclusive for our listeners. It's troll-free, algorithm-free, and all about plants. You can connect with plant friends near and far on it. If you're interested, click the link in the bio to learn more. And speaking of the holidays, if you need last minute gifts, my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness and Plants would make a fantastic gift for anyone in your life, really. It's a self-help book at the intersection of self-care and plant care. So how can we use plants to live a happier life? And that is really in line with today's episode. How can we use plants beyond aesthetics, right? How can we use plants medicinally for our lives? I know this topic can be intimidating, especially because if you eat the wrong plants, it can be a problem. So please, large disclaimer at the beginning of this episode, this episode is meant to whet your appetite, for lack of a better word, on the topic of herbalism. But please, before you consume anything, consult your doctor, consult a textbook, consult, you know, true experts uh, before you really get into this this topic. That's why after this episode, I mean, I really started practicing what Juliet, our guest, talks about with herbs that I've already been growing and consuming, like basil, spearmint, you know, my mint collection, starting with what I know and then working my way up. Because plant friends, herbalism has always been something I've been curious about, especially as you grow, right? Like as you grow herbs and plants, edible plants, you want to really get the biggest bang for your buck. You want to make sure that you're using what you grow. And as, you know, we kind of expand the topics that we talk about on this podcast into wellness through the lens of plants, wellness rooted in plants, herbalism was, you know, a very hot topic that I was very interested in exploring. And enter Juliet Blankenspoor, who is the author of The Healing. Healing Garden, Cultivating and Handcrafting Herbal Remedies. It's a book dedicated to herbalism. Juliet has dedicated her life to herbalism. She has an incredible website and the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine. She served thousands of students around the globe teaching the secrets and the practice of herbalism. Her book is a bestseller. It's so gorgeous. And the rest, we'll talk about it in the conversation, but the recipes are incredible. They're not your general like run of the mill pesto. It's like really cool recipes. Anyway, Juliet has a lot to share, so I'm going to shut up and let her talk. (laughs) So without further ado, welcome to our Herbalism 101 episode with Juliet Blankets 4. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio, Juliet. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I have quickly become a true fan of yours, and I'm so excited to dive into this topic on the medicinal benefits of herbs and how we can make our own tea. And in honor of today's episode interview, I took your book. I've actually been making my own mint tea from your book's recipe for the last week. I'm totally obsessed. My husband is so blown away by how much more delicious home brewed mint tea is then from a little package. So I've got several different types of mint and honey in here today. Mm, Yum. So before we dive into what is in my tea and the medicinal benefits of my tea, let's talk about you and how you became the founder of the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine. 
Mm, well, I grew up with um, my grandpa was like a little, you know, he was actually a banker in New York City, but he had a hobby farm and he was really, that was his true heart's calling. But so I grew up like going on his tractor. And then when he moved to our, where I was living, where I grew up, he made a little garden in our backyard. And then my dad is... Dutch gardener comes from farming roots. So they all tried to rope me in when I was a kid and I just was not interested. I just was all about like books and bikes. And, but when, when I left home, I went to college and I was studying languages and I just caught the plant bug. It was like, I don't even really know where it came from. I was really getting interested, I guess, in what was happening to the earth and environmental crisis. And from that, like an interest in the green world blossomed. And for me, it was just like an instantaneous obsession that has never left me. I'm, you know, I can't even really explain it, but it was just became my life's calling. And it's one that I followed. I switched majors to botany from studying like French and Italian. It was a huge shift, but because I was so interested in plants, it just, it was a lot easier for me than I ever could have imagined. Wow. So you studied plants in school. What did your degree end up being in? It was a botany degree. It was a botany degree. Yeah. So I took every kind of field botany class that I could. I mean, we had to do like plant anatomy and physiology and a lot of kind of like real technical microscopic classes, but I took every field botany that the school offered. So it was in the horticulture department and the wildlife department. It wasn't just even in the botany department. And I would just like beg the teachers to let me in and they would. And I, that's how I started learning about gardening Like my first garden was a total flop because I had no idea what I was doing, but I was just determined to do it. And that's how I learned. And and the strange part about it is that even though I didn't even get any crop from that garden, nothing, I felt like I was a gardener. It was like a weird psychological hurdle that I can totally relate to that. Yeah, I was like, I don't really have to be good at this. I just have to be doing it. And from that, I learned, you know, I learned from other gardeners. And I actually took a class where our university had an organic gardening class, which was surprising because I was in the 80s. And I learned a lot there and just have, just took off from there. And yeah, got super interested into growing. And then I was already really interested in herbal medicine, but this is like before the internet and there weren't very many books. And I just would like learn the scientific name of a plant in school. Like I'd be learning about bayberry and I'd be like, oh, that's Mirica serifera. I know about that plant from this book that I'm reading. And then I would go home and read the book and it would be like, oh, bayberry, you use the root bark. And I was like, I didn't even know roots had bark. And like just started experimenting that way. So, um, but then I did find formal teachers, herbal medicine teachers. So I did receive formal training, but I think it's just probably like many of your listeners, just an obsession. And from that obsession, we learn everything we can about the, that topic. And it's so much easier now with podcasts and the internet and so many books. And YouTube, totally. Yes, yes. And so let's talk about what makes plants medicinal for a moment. Are there doctors that have proven the medicinal benefits of these plants? Like, how is it getting measured? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, It's much harder to identify the medicinal qualities of plants versus a pharmaceutical because plants will contain thousands of bioactive compounds, like one plant. And it's a synergy of those compounds, their effect in our body. So it's not just like one compound. And then also plants' medicinal qualities, because they're so biochemically complex, they can have differing effects on the same person depending on their stage of their health. So for instance, we have herbs that help lower blood pressure, when people have hypertension, but they don't universally lower blood pressure in people who have 
healthy blood pressure levels. So that makes it really hard to study plants. Plus, the other thing is there's way less money, as you can imagine, involved in studying plants. So I would say of all the medicinal plants out there, only a small fraction of them have been studied for medicinal qualities. And then it's once again, really hard to design studies. So the traditional knowledge of plant medicine is where everything comes from. Indigenous peoples all over the world used medicinal plants before we had the advent of like modern conventional medicine. And that's where all of our knowledge comes from and that's where people decide what stu- what plants to study what's you know which ones to investigate but it's it's really still it's a wide open field that is you know studied more and more because so many people are taking plant medicines but there's so much more to learn yeah that's very interesting because i feel like the more that i study indigenous wisdom and teachings There's a reason why this has been successful for so long, right? Yet it isn't scientifically proven, so people dismiss it. But the more I look into this, the more I'm like, man, if we operated in this style now or on a greater scale, I think so many things would be solved in the world. I just, I don't know. The more I learn, the more I believe in it. In your book, you talk about the energetics of plants, which I thought was really interesting, and the energetics of people. It kind of reminded me of like when I was into Ayurveda and kind of all of the different doshas and and energies within your body. But in your book, you talk about the energetics of plants and how you match them to the energetics of people. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Yeah. So yeah, once again, this comes back to traditional systems of medicine from all over the world have their own way of understanding and classifying the energetics of specific plants and also the constitutions of humans and how they fit together. So it's way, it's way more complex than just, let's say you have intestinal gas, so you take mint. Well, that is a really helpful starting point, but for some people, mint can cause heartburn, you know, and so you have to figure out how they match. And I think a lot of people can relate to understanding how foods or herbs can have an energetic quality. When we think about what we are attracted to during specific seasons. For So for instance, in the summer, we might be really wanting cucumber or cucumber and lemon water uh, or watermelon. And those foods are all very cooling to our body. And in the winter, we are going to crave cinnamon and cayenne and soups made with warming spices and herbs. And that's because our bodies tend to be running cooler in the winter. So that's a sort of a, a simple seasonal example. But if you've ever noticed how some people have really dry hair, Hair, or some people have really oily hair or dry skin or oily skin or some people have a lot of trouble with their sinuses over the winter getting too dry and others don't, right? We have these kind of what my teacher Michael Moore called of like constitutional leanings. We run cold, we run warm, we run dry or moist. And so herbs have qualities where they're either like moistening or drying or warming or cooling. And so matching an herb's energetics to our energetics is just a more effective way of delivering medicine. And, you know, that can be a little complex to learn. There's a couple books like The Alchemy of Herbs I would recommend to your readers by Rosalie de la Fore is a great one for kind of beginning understanding the energetics of plants. Yeah, I know just from listening, just from what you said, I definitely run dry and I run hot. And I feel like that's something that you just need to kind of intuitively know about yourself. Like I'm always sweating in the middle of the night and my skin is dry. So you're saying knowing that I can consume herbs and plants that are cooling and moisture based to heal myself or to help with my dry skin. 
Yes, exactly. So for example, since you like mint tea, you might combine some marshmallow root in that tea, which is cooling and moistening. Or you might include some cinnamon, which is moistening in the winter and it's warming, but not super heating. So that might be like a nice combination for you. And, you know, it's the same thing with food as medicine that our moistening foods are the ones that are really high in soluble fiber like oatmeal and barley and chia seed and okra. You know, all those like slimy foods are like, they're like lotion or moisturizer for our insides. So yeah, we could think about herbs and foods that have those energetic qualities. Where do you personally lean in your constitution? I am run dry like you. Um, like it, for anyone who's familiar with Ayurveda, I have a lot of vata in me. So I do really well with like moist foods. And then, um, you know, my constitution is changing too as I get older and as I go through menopause, I'm definitely getting uh getting these like hot flashes and um that's interesting but I tend to run cold so I really I do a lot of hydrotherapy like cold showers actually warm me up or me too I love a cold I take cold showers every morning yeah they're so invigorating and and really like warm you up kind of reset your body I mean at first you might be cold but then you're warmer throughout the day I'm actually looking into getting a cold plunge. I'm a total believer of Wim Hof and Uh his practices. If you don't know what we're talking about, you can watch, um, this was a controversial documentary, but this particular episode, the goop documentary that features Wim Hof is a great profile on what he does and how he does it. But exposure to cold, I will say I did cold showers all of last year didn't get COVID. (laughs) Not that I'm endorsing. I mean, I'm not saying this, but you know, I'm very curious at the fact that I took cold showers every day through July, never got sick this winter. And then the minute I stopped because I started traveling, I got COVID. Mm, Yeah. Um, And I'm vaccinated and boosted and stuff, but I I thought that was very interesting that I really do feel like from a immune standpoint, cold showers Mm -hmm. really helped me. Well, and that's again so much. So many traditional cultures, people bathed in cold, wild waters every day to keep their immune system up. And like my grandpa took a cold shower religiously every day and almost never got sick and lived to be in his late 80s despite being like a smoker and a drinker. Yeah. <laughs> so my husband I, jumps in our pond. It's 40 degrees. It was 60 degrees this weekend and he jumped in our pond. He's a maniac. Oh, wow. He's a real maniac. (laughs) Anyway, back to, we digress. This is, this is an episode about herbs, not cold immersion, but if the listeners are interested in, in an episode on that, please let me know and I'll bring in a cold expert. So I also loved the section of your book. So, you know, the, I think the thing that has always intimidated me about herbalism I'm very interested in it. I've grown herbs. Herbs were my, I say herbs were my gateway drug for growing all plants. My houseplant collection actually started because I was growing herbs on my tiny balcony. And when those thrived, I decided I wanted to bring that indoors, but I didn't have the light for herbs. So I I went to houseplants. I love the idea of drying my herbs, using them through the winter, but there's so much to learn it's almost a whole different language with herbalism and it's a whole different set of skills. And it's also scary because if you (laughs) ingest the wrong thing, you could get really sick. You know, we've gotten really into mushroom foraging now that we live in the mountains. And that's also still really scary because a lot of those mushrooms, the poisonous ones look really similar to the not poisonous ones. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the benefits and some of these definitions that you have in your book that if we're a total newbie to herbalism, but we've been growing herbs, how do we like get our feet wet in approaching this whole new world of the medicinal benefits? Such a good question. So, okay. So first of all, if you already grow vegetables, successfully or even ornamental plants or natives, you can grow 
medicinal herbs, right? And there's also a huge overlap between culinary herbs and medicinal herbs. So a lot of the herbs that you're probably already growing have really potent medicinal uses. Like just one example is rosemary is a really powerful antioxidant. So it really helps as an anti-inflammatory and to help prevent cardiovascular disease and cancer and also keep your mind fresh. It's a classic herb for supporting um, cognition as we age. So that's just one example of a culinary herb. And so that's a good place to start, I think, for those of you who already grow culinary herbs and cook. The other suggestion I would say is to start with fewer plants and really get to know them. And you've got to remember several things. One, Medicinal plants have specific parts that we use, right? So you have to know, do we use the root? Do we use the leaves? Do we use the flowers? That's really important. So for example, when you're growing potatoes, the leaves are poisonous, but we eat the tubers. So medicinal plants are similar in that not all their parts are medicinal. And in fact, sometimes when you are using the wrong part, it is poisonous. More than not, it's just not medicinal, but so you want to start with fewer plants. You want to know which part you're using. And then the best preparation, that's another really important point, is some herbs are better extracted in vinegar. Some are better extracted in water in the form of tea or in alcohol. So you want to I start off with a good book. So my book, The Healing Garden, is a great reference on growing medicinal herbs, drying them and using them in both the kitchen and the medicine chest. So I would just start with like a handful of plants, five at the most, and get to know them. And in fact, what I did when I was first learning about herbs was I would like journal about each one. And I would, when I dried them, I'd write about their medicinal qualities on the jar. And that helped me know when I went to make a tea, okay, what is this good for? But it also just helped me learn more about that plant so that I could use it effectively. Okay, gardeners, Territorial Seed Company's new spring catalog is now available online and will be in your mailboxes soon. They're kind of known for their catalog. I like getting it in person. It's beautifully illustrated usually, and it's chock full of more than 70 new varieties, including dozens of new flowers and all of your old favorites, like all of the tomato varieties that I grew and loved, like blush, indigo cherry drops, and of course, my favorite pineapple ground cherries. Make sure to check out their selection of online exclusives as well, including a new black pepper vine plant and much more. With over 40 years of experience, Territorial Seed Company has high quality products you can trust. Order early and put your mind at ease knowing that you're going to be getting all the essential seeds, plants, and supplies that you need to grow your best garden ever. Seriously, if you are starting seeds this year, you've got to check out Territorial Seed Company. I've been using their seeds for like three years now and I absolutely love them. And just for listeners, we've got a code for you, code GROW10, G-R-O-W-10, one zero, gets you 10% off your first order. So once again, that's code GROW10 at territorialseed.com for 10% off your first order. Thanks to our longtime supporter, Espoma Organics. Espoma is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. If this episode inspires you to grow medicinal plants of your own, Espoma has the potting mix, the garden soil, and the fertilizer to help set you up for success. I grow my herbs in containers and in grow bags, and I use their general potting mix. And when I pot the herbs up initially at the start of the season, I use their Biotone starter plant food to help them establish roots. And then I will go and use their line of tones, their tone fertilizers, depending on what I'm growing. And if you're growing herbs in the ground, you can use Espoma's land and sea organic compost and their garden soil. But plant friends, whether you're growing herbs, edible plants, flowers, or larger landscape plants, or maybe just tending to your lawn, Espoma has the product for you. To learn more about their organic products for indoors and outdoors, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to the Bloom and Grow Amazon storefront for a list of my Espoma favorites. 
That's exactly what I did. You know, your publicist reached out to me about your book. I have always had this curiosity of plant medicine or herbal medicine, but always been intimidated. So I said, sure, send me her book. I'll, I'll take a look at her book. Let's see if, if it's a fit. And I looked through your book. You have these amazing profiles of all of the different herbal medicines that you talk about. I looked at my herb garden because I garden and grow bags and I have three types of mint, which you break down. The different mints can, can mean different things. Basil, what I grow in my herb garden and my culinary garden is rosemary, basil, chives, mint, and oregano. And so I just was like, I wonder if the plants that I'm growing are in her book. Let me just kind of read the beginning, the educational part of the book, and then I'll flip through her things. And yeah, like she's got like, I don't know, words I've never seen before. And she's got plants I've never heard of before. I'm not even going to read those yet. And I'm just going to go read about mint and like, see how I feel. The mint section had a tea recipe. So I was like, oh, this is cool. I made moon water yesterday. Let's make a herbal mint tea with, you know, my moon water. Like that sounds kind of fun. And now I'm thumbing through your book, you know, looking at rosemary, looking at what else I can do. So I do feel like you really, you hit the nail on the head. And that's definitely been my experience in the last couple of weeks of consuming your education is, you know, starting really small. <laughs> but I'm so proud of my tea that I've made, right? Like I've never made, I've been a tea drinker my whole life. I've never made homegrown harvested tea with plants that I've grown. And it was really cool. It was like a new, new way of a new farm to table experience, you know, but it's like farm to soul and body kind of. Mm, so true. It's, it's really rewarding. And I think we all have this like ancestral wisdom within us and it just touches on something deep inside us to make our own medicine is so satisfying. Yeah. So what are some of the properties? I'm, I'm going to guess mint is in a lot of people's gardens. So what are some of the properties of mint? Yeah. So mint is a carminative, which I think most of you are probably familiar with, which we have these herbal action terms, which are really just a shorthand way of describing how an herb affects human and other animal bodies. But so just helping to allay intestinal gas. So if you have a lot of bloating or belching, um, and then also mint is one of our most gentle nervines. So nervines are the herbs that help support our nervous system. And nervines is sort of a broad class of herbs. So within it, we have like herbs that help us sleep, which we call hypnotics. Um, and then we have herbs that are anti-anxiety. And those are also a type of nervine. So mint is one of those herbs that's really safe for elders and children and doesn't have a lot of precautions with people who are taking pharmaceutical medications. So just nice relaxing one before bedtime or during the day and can also just really improve ingestion along with reducing intestinal gas. I love that. Can we kind of go through some of the, the standard herbs that a lot of us might not know have medicinal quality? So what about basil? Basil is another one that everybody's got in their gardens. Yeah. So basil, like rosemary, in fact, most of our Mediterranean herbs are is really a potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. So it's one of those herbs that can really, it's just a good tonic medicine. And this is where herbs really shine. It's like everyday medicine that we can consume as food or a more like conventional type of herbal medicine. But so basil's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, it's a good one to help just fight like free radical stress and environmental toxins and reduce one's risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer. Like if you're a cancer survivor like me, I'm always looking to incorporate more antioxidant foods in my diet. And that includes thyme, rosemary, 
basil, sage, and just, you know, putting like handfuls of those foods in my dishes. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why people who uh, use a lot of those foods in their diet have some of the most, have some of the longest lifespans. And so with those tonic herbs that you're talking about, the ones that you just mentioned, which are definitely the ones that we're all growing, are you just putting them in your recipes? You mentioned tonic. Are you making tonics or like elixirs with them? Like what's the best way to ingest them? Yeah, tonic's kind of a confusing term, I think, for a lot of people. So tonic can mean just something that you can take daily that is generally safe and um doesn't have like super strong effects, like it's not going to put you to sleep or um, it's not going to raise your temperature. So tonic just being on a daily level versus something that you take like acutely, like, you know, echinacea if you're fighting off a cold or flu. So there are so many ways to incorporate these tonic herbs, um, you know, like just if you're making like a homemade uh, marinara sauce or if you're making a broth, like that's one of my favorite ways to bring medicinal plants into um, food is making healing broth. So like in my book, I have this recipe for a medicinal mushroom broth that also has calendula, if any of y'all are growing that flower. Just a wonderful tonic food throughout the winter to keep our immune systems um, safe. But so even just eating pesto, right? Pesto from fresh basil. And in my book, I talk about about other kinds of pestos. You can use lemon balm in your pesto if anyone's growing that. Fresh lemon balm pesto is one of my favorite foods. And uh, yeah, there's a recipe for that in my book with lemon balm and pistachios. You know, you can really like branch out from the traditional pine nuts and Mm -hmm. Parmesan of pesto and, and use other ingredients like if you're lactose intolerant or you avoid dairy for you know various reasons you can use other substitutes for the dairy so i think pestos and butters and vinegars are all wonderful ways we can take these healing plants i made um i don't know if this is a medicinal thing but i made chive blossom vinegar uh-huh. this summer for the first time and gave it away as gifts and it's so gorgeous in a bottle mm. It's pink. It's so yes. cute. <laughs> pink is so fun and vinegars. Yeah. Are chives medicinal? I mean, are there is are there medicinal properties of, of chives? They are. Um, they're the you know anti-inflammatory and increased circulation. It's definitely not like I think an herb that I use a lot for medicinal, more for culinary yeah. uses. But what's interesting is that pink in your vinegar came from the bioflavonoids in those petals, right? Mm -hmm. We think of like bioflavonoids in berries, Mm -hmm. right? And then you know that's why like blueberries and raspberries are so good for our heart and anti-aging and anti-inflammatory. But edible flowers, the flowers are colored with those same compounds that color berries, So any of our edible flowers and the preparations we make from them are medicinal in that they have a lot of bioflavonoids. Interesting. Huh. Okay. So they're pretty and helpful to our (laughs) immune systems. Okay. So let's get down to tea because I think tea is going to be the most accessible way for people to get into, you know, trying to use these medicines and then going from there. So how do we make tea if we've got mint or, you know, I forgot, I have lemon balm in my tea as well. I put my lemon balm in my mints all together and now I can like, I don't know, barely differentiate them all, but I can't believe how easy tea is. Like, can you walk us through how we're making tea with fresh and with dried? Yeah. So you're going to get more bang for your buck with if you dry your herbs first to make your tea, but you can make tea from fresh herbs. You're just going to have to use like 
two or three times as much of plant material. But I love to make like fresh, that's probably the easiest way is just let's say in the summer when you've got fresh lemon balm or mint or for any of you that grow anise hyssop or you might know it as Korean licorice mint or uh, lemon verbena or lemongrass, you can just like stuff a jar full of those herbs, put it in the sun for like four hours and strain it. And um, that's not going to be the strongest tasting tea, but sort of more like an infused water flavor. Um, But so really just drying your herbs. So Picking your herbs, and if they are clean and in an area that's not sprayed and there's no dirt on them, you don't even need to wash them. And you can just dry them either if you have a dehydrator, you can dry them that way. Or for me, I put herbs on a indoor clothes rack, like those Amish clothes racks. You can just hang them from there. And where I live, my climate's real humid. It depends on where you live. But because it's humid where I live, I put a dehumidifier in that room and it speeds up the drying process. And the quicker you dry your herbs, the more potent they will be. And after they're dried, you want to put them in a jar to keep out the ambient moisture because they will reabsorb ambient moisture. So put them in a jar, so an airtight jar or a bag, like a Ziploc bag, and then they'll keep for a year to two, like leaves and flowers keep a year to two, roots even longer. And then if you're using like a recipe in a book, those recipes are usually, they're giving store-bought tea proportions for loose tea. So when you buy tea that's just like loose and not in a tea bag, it's in smaller pieces than when we home, you know, when we dry herbs at home. So you're going to use a little bit more tea than you would use in, let's say, a tea bag because it's not going to be as like mushed into small, smaller pieces by machinery. You can crumble it yourself. Once the herbs are dry, you can tell they're dry because you'll crumble and you can, they'll crunch. And that's how you can tell that they're dry enough to store, right? Because as you can imagine, if you store them when they still have some moisture, they'll mold in that jar. So make sure they're dry when you store them and then you can crumble them or not crumble them. But to make a simple infusion, the, the easiest way is if you have a French press that you want to keep separate from coffee if you use your French press for coffee. But that is the easiest way to make homemade tea with loose herbs. Or you can buy these cute little tea strainers. Um, Mountain Rose Herbs is a good place to buy them. But anywhere that sells uh, medicinal qualities, then it's just a little strainer that'll sit right on your individual tea mug. Put your herbs in it, pour your boiling water over it, let it sit for two to five minutes and then just put this the herb in the compost and then you pull your strainer out and you're ready to go. It's easy. I love it. Yeah, we have a French press. So that's that's what I was doing and it's so easy. So let's just go back for a minute. So two questions. You have a great example of it in your book, but basically when you're harvesting your herbs, so say I'm harvesting a bunch of mint, I'm basically going to make a little bundle with a rubber band and then dry it, hanging it upside down. Uh When the mint is dry and it crumbles, do I have to remove the mint leaves from the stalk, from the stem, or can I, does the stem also have medicinal properties? That's such a good question. It really depends on each plant. Okay. But often the stem is slightly medicinal or it's just not. It's sort of like inert, but it's not going to hurt you. So most people strip the leaves off the stem just because it takes up less space and the, you know, the stem isn't as medicinal, but it's not that hard to just, you know, what you'll do is you take a basket or a stainless steel bowl and just, you know, make a long stripping motion and just, it's almost like shucking corn and you're just taking the leaves off of the stem and then compost the stem and store the leaves. 
Yeah, I just got a low me tabletop composter and my we're like so obsessed <laughs> with it because all of a sudden we're putting all of our food scraps in the compost instead of and you know, we're in the middle of nowhere in the mountains, so we can't we don't have a composting program where we live. So we we're feeling very bad about all of our garbage, but yeah, that's great. It's so simple. So what kind of teas do you like to make? Obviously mint. What other herbs would you suggest growing to be able to grow your own tea? Mm. Well, okay. So lemongrass, super easy to grow. Even if you live in a temperate climate, you just grow it as an annual and it grows huge. Mm -hmm. So um, I just did a video series on my Instagram. If you want to look at that, the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine and one lemongrass plant gave me a gallon and a half of tea. Wow. I mean, that is a lot of tea. And with lemongrass, you can harvest it two times throughout the growing season. So you could even get double that amount. Um, lemon verbena is another really delightful one to grow. And for those of you who are growing in containers, you can grow it very easily in a pot. It's very beautiful. If you live in a warmer climate, like for those of you who live in, I would say, zones... Um, nine or warmer, you can grow it outdoors as a shrub and you can get a lot of tea off of that shrub. And I just, I love the flavor of lemon verbena. It's such a, it's way more popular as a tea herb in Europe than the United States. It's really interesting, the different trends between the different countries, but lemon verbena is so pleasant tasting and smelling as the tea and easy to grow. Um, calendula is a great one to grow in between your vegetable plants because it is a beneficial companion herb, mm -hmm. um, attracting beneficial insects. And we use the flowers for tea. And I like the flavor. It's kind of tastes a little bit chocolatey, but it's a great tea to drink throughout the winter to keep your immune system nimble and ready. And um, it's also a gentle nervine, so helping you feel more relaxed. And a lot of people know about calendula from salves or like it's the most famous diaper ointment herb, uh, but it also has a lot of internal uses. So that's a great one to grow because you've got internal and external uses. And we have, t I have a ton of resources on my blog, Castanea, which is uh, the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine, my school's blog. We have more articles on growing and using uh, medicinal herbs than any other place on the internet. So if you are interested in learning more about any of these herbs, you can check that out. But And mint, as you mentioned many times, super easy to grow, highly versatile. Um, and the other one I would love to recommend to your listeners is licorice mint or anise hyssop. And a lot of people are growing that more as an ornamental these days because there's some new ver cultivars that are super showy. But if you like the flavor of licorice or anise, you will love this flavor. And it's in the mint family. It's not really related to licorice or anise, but it's a plant that is indigenous to North America. So everything that we know about it comes from so many different indigenous peoples use it as both a culinary herb, but also a medicinal. So it's really... A lot of similar properties to mint in that it helps with digestion and it's a gentle herb for going to sleep or helping you feel um, relaxed, but you can make vinegars out of it. You can make herbal butters. I have like a, you can make sorbet out of it, grenadilla, ice cream. You can infuse it into milk and make scones out of it. So what about chamomile? I failed at growing chamomile this year. Didn't nail it. Yeah, I honestly don't think chamomile is the easiest herb to grow in the home garden and the yield is so small. That's how I felt. I was super bummed by it. I mean, I just think it's like, you know, it's like so many, it's so easy for us to grow like lettuce or kale or collards, but if you have a small garden, it's not as easy to grow like hard beans or grains. And I kind of think of chamomile in that same vein, like let the big farms do it. That's just, <laughs> that's just my thought. 
You might have heard me talk about the Lomi lately, but many of you might be thinking, Maria, what is the Lomi? Well, I'm going to answer that for you today in two different ways. Number one, I'll tell you it's a sleek, small countertop composter that can reduce your garbage footprint by up to 50%. But I'm going to do you one better, plant friends. I actually wrangled my husband, Billy, to literally take you along for our daily evening and morning composting routine. You're about to hear me and him in our kitchen. The audio quality will be a little bit worse because because we're live recording this, uh, sharing what goes in and what comes out of our Lomi in the evening and the following morning. So please enjoy. Uh, we have a cucumber I forgot about in the back of the refrigerator, eggshells from this morning, uh, some apple cores, and the uh, coffee filter that we used for coffee this morning, and a couple of potato scraps. Now, I'm also, I've cut up um, some of the packaging that the Lomi was shipped in. So we actually can take the packaging and turn it into dirt. And then the craziest thing that we're including, I have been a lover of the Pela phone case. It's completely compostable. And they, the owners of Pela are the founders of the Lomi. So we're literally composting my cell phone case. I cut it up, we're tossing it in the Lomi. All right, Billy, will you do the honors? Off we go. And it's the quietest little. And this hump. is yeah, and this is what it sounds this is like. As loud if you're as it gets. Here we go. Morning, Billy. Good morning, Donna. <laughs> so we did just what we said. We ran the Lomi last night. So, Billy, do you want to do the honors of opening it up and telling us what you see? Sure. It's like fluffy. Yeah. Dirt it's... soil. It's wild that my freaking phone. Was a part of this. You can see like tiny little flecks of my yellow foam case. Yeah. But we can literally take this and plant plants in it, throw it in our garden, use it, put it in your green bin. It's Life. wild. It literally works every time. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it. I'm like waiting for the shoe to drop, but we've had this thing for three months now. Yeah. It just does. It takes your freaking food scraps and your cell phone yeah. and turns it into dirt. So, Lomi does not give a lot of coupon codes, but they've given us a coupon code because they're a podcast sponsor. $50 off the code BLOOM. It's linked in the show notes. And if you click the link in the show notes, it'll take you to the special page where you'll also get three months of Lomi pods for free. I hope you enjoyed that live ad read. We took you into the kitchen. So once again, you can head to payla.earth slash bloom if you're interested in getting a Lomi for yourself and using code bloom at checkout for $50 off. travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. This is amazing. Yeah. So I feel like everyone, you know, this is coming out in November. Some of our hardier plants, probably like mint and sage, if you're in the Northeast, are still hanging in there. Can't recommend trying growing your tea enough. I have to ask you, what do you feel like as gardeners who aren't maybe beginner, beginner herbalists, but seasoned gardeners, like what are some of the most versatile medicinal plants that you might not find in a traditional culinary garden that you would recommend someone like me who's curious, like start exploring? Mm. 
Yeah, so definitely the licorice mint. And one of the reasons, too, is that it's like so amazing in attracting bees and butterflies and native pollinators. I mean, and it's just a showstopper. And you can interplant that. Like, I plant it along my walkway, you know, and I plant lavender along my walkway. So I like beautifying my space, attracting pollinators, and harvesting medicine. So I think that lavender is another great one to grow that a lot of people are already growing. So, okay, so new plants to grow for experienced vegetable gardeners. Is that kind of your question? More like maybe plants that are grown more for the medicinal properties than the culinary properties. So plants that if I basically have a culinary garden, I might not know about this plant that I should add into my garden so I can enjoy the medicinal benefits of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, yeah, so I think the lemongrass and the lemon verbena, those are medicinal plants that a lot of people are not currently growing. Um, another one is prickly pear. Um, so oh, you have a whole series on your Instagram right now about that. I was watching it earlier today. Yeah, so prickly pear, I mean, even if prickly pear goes in the wild up into, I've seen it up in like Connecticut and Massachusetts, um, there's really cold hardy varieties. And then of course, those of you who live in arid climates, in warmer arid climates, you've got a lot of prickly pear growing wild, but there's different varieties you can grow. And I recommend growing like the spineless variety of prickly pear. And it's just one of the most versatile medicinal herbs and foods that you can grow. So if any of you have eaten nopales or nopalitos in like a Mexican restaurant, or maybe that's from your tradition, it is one of the best foods for lowering cholesterol levels and lowering blood pressure. And then you can use the goo inside of the pad, the mucilage, much as you would use aloe vera. It's a traditional Ooh. remedy for burns and rashes. And then the fruit, so high in antioxidants, probably one of the most highest foods, uh, fruits in antioxidant levels. So it has the same compounds that give beets that beautiful red color or like, you know, those like rainbow Swiss chards with like the fuchsias and the yellows. Those are all from betalanes and that prickly pear fruit has betalanes. And any of you who live in the Southwest or have traveled to the Southwest, have you seen like prickly pear margaritas that are like fuchsia? Mm -hmm. Those are from the betaline compound, so really powerful antioxidants. And I, I know I kind of probably sound like a broken record here with the antioxidants, but, you know, the more that we know about chronic disease, about autoimmune conditions, heart disease, and cancer, which are, as people know, the leading killers uh, amongst Americans, this is the best preventative medicine for those conditions is our antioxidant food and herbs. So that's why I just keep talking about them. No, I think that's, I think that's really cool. And I think from the gardener's perspective, we get into growing our own food because we want to have more control over organic food or, you know, the varietals that we want. So I feel like the next level, the next step naturally is figuring out what those medicinal properties are and how we can, you know, use food to heal uh -huh. or heal or preemptively stay healthy and feel good too. I mean, it's interesting that so many of the, me the herbs we talked about today are, what was the word that you use? The ones that make you calmer? Nervines. Nervines. And yes. I think we all need some nervines in our life, man. I think everybody could use some calm. Um, so make some tea with some nervines, plant friends. One other question I wanted to ask you, because the thing, the other thing with reading your book that really impressed me was, um, the recipes you have. I mean, I feel like when I look at a herbal medicine book, I'm thinking I'm getting tinctures and infusions and teas and that's it. You have like 
wild recipes in your book that look so delicious. So what's your favorite recipe from your book? I have to ask. Yeah, I love the food as medicine recipes because, you know, teas and tinctures and capsules, you can only take so much of them. But when you're making, you're already making food, so why not make it healing? So my favorite, I mentioned the lemon balm pesto. I think that that is really my favoriteest recipe in that book. And I just... The first time I tried it, uh, one of my students made it. And I have to say, I, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm going to try this, but this sounds disgusting. <laughs> and like, so good. The other thing is bee balm. A lot of you probably already grow bee balm. A lot of us balm. grow bee balm. Yeah, pollinator, yes. pollinator haven, that bee balm. Yes. Well, bee balm is, it's a North American native or all the Monardas are native to the North Americas and such a traditional indigenous food, but also culinary herb. And a lot of people don't know that. So the bee balm sprigs, when they're just coming up in the early spring, and you know, they're one of the first coming up, they are delicious in pesto. Really? Um, a, yes, so good. Like people love it way more even than basil pesto, especially if you're growing uh, the Monarda fistulosa, which is, you know, most people grow Monarda didyma, which is like, they're both called bee balm, but Monarda fistulosa, for those of you who live in a more arid climate or a hotter climate, that one's going to do better for you because it's more adapted to those um, climates. And that's my favorite culinary Monarda. So Monarda pesto. And um, in my book, I have a kind of a baseline recipe for how you can make your own pestos and which herbs you can use. Um, chickweed pesto is another one of my favorite, or I have a recipe in there for violet hummus. So, you know, a lot of you have violets growing as a, a I'm going to call it a weed, but most of us have native violets that are growing. I have so many of them. Yes. And they are delicious in hummus. So that's just, you know, you just throw a handful in when you're making your hummus. and Of the flowers or the greens of the violets? The greens of the violets. Okay. And yeah, those grains are very high in soluble fiber. Um, so really helpful, like oatmeal and reducing excess cholesterol levels from the mm -hmm. body. Also super high in vitamins A, C, and E. So really potent. Yeah, just powerhouses nutritionally. And, um, and most of us just like are pulling them out of our garden because they're kind of weedy. The common blue violet is actually a native violet, um, which I think is interesting, but it's can be a weed in our garden. So, you know, I do have to weed it out because it will outcompete some other plants that I want to grow but I will pick the greens and then weed it out and use the greens. And that's another great way that you can, like in, uh, in my book, I talk about chickweed and dandelion. So these plants that are already growing in your garden, even if you didn't plant them there, are just a way that you can get more out of your garden because they're food and medicine. And so you can let them grow in certain spaces and times, like in early spring before you're planting out like your peppers or tomatoes, and then harvest them before you plant your peppers and mm. tomatoes. So you are getting sort of like another seasonal harvest, even if you don't plant it. Yeah, I'm renting. I wish I got your book a few months ago because I'm renting and, uh, my lawn, which is organically treated, is dandelion fest in the spring. I mean, more dandelion than grass. And uh, I remember looking at all the dandelions being like, I know these are medicinal. I can't wrap my head around it. I have my own book launch. I cannot. I don't want to, you know, poison myself by accident. So I just didn't. But now next year, I'm like, oh, we're harvesting all those dandelions and getting those benefits. Oh, yeah. So everyone should get your book. It's so informative. I'm really looking forward to, it's a genuine, I mean, it's a textbook. It's huge. It's a hardcover. I was shocked when it came, like how substantial it is. And I'm looking forward to like growing with it. You know, I feel like I'm really, I really only read my, you know, my five herbs that I know and the first half of the book, which is more educational, but it'll be fun to 
next year go back to it and maybe pick some new, you know, plants that I hadn't grown before. So please tell us about your book. Where can people find it? And what's its name? So, um, so it's the healing garden, cultivating and handcrafting herbal remedies. And, um, my, you can go to the healing garden gateway.com and that links to booksellers, um, national and then also local booksellers and international sellers. And then we have all these bonuses that come with the book. We have an entire free course of 10 videos on how to make your own teas and tinctures and a lot about plant propagation. And then there's charts in that gateway that you can print out and use in your garden that um, we couldn't include in the book. Plus, you can write in the charts when you print them out. And then the other really exciting thing, that these bonuses that come with the book are just off the chart. And we have these regional herb gardening profiles written by herb gardening experts who live in different areas of North America. So if you live, yeah, in the subtropics, you can find what's the best herbs to grow in the subtropics. What's Very the best cool. herb? Yes. Oh, I love that. And then you have really amazing looking courses. I have not taken them yet, but they look fantastic. And we're, you're offering a nice little incentive to our listeners who might want to like not just go beyond the book, but actually take one of your classes. We'll include the link for that in the in the show notes so you'll know what, what incentive you'll get by checking the show notes and clicking the link. But do you want to talk about the courses that you have to offer too? Because I was looking on your website today and I was like, damn, this might be fun to take in the winter when I'm stuck at home, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when most people sign up for the courses in the winter. So we have a medicine making course, which is great for beginners because it talks you, teach, leads you through all the major medicinal preparations. A lot of food is medicine preparations and then also what they're good for. So that's a great beginner course. Then we also have a foraging course, which is really backyard medicine and edibles so plants that really grow all over the country as quote unquote weeds and how you can use identify them a ton on identification so you mm-hmm. don't hurt yourself and then so you're safe um, but how you can use them with like hundreds of recipes and then um, our flagship most in-depth program is the herbal immersion program and it's the most in-depth program on hands-on herbalism in the world um, that's online and that is a two and a half year program so we have most of the people who take that program are interested professionally in a career in herbal medicine but we have a lot of people who take it just because it's their lifelong passion or and hobby. their lifestyle they want to like live the lifestyle of herbal medicine yeah it looks really cool thanks Well, that's amazing. And then where can people find you on social media? Yeah, so Chestnut School Herbs on Instagram, uh, because Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine is a little too long for the tag. Um, but we're on TikTok, Facebook. We have a Healing Garden Facebook page that focuses just really on growing medicinal and plants and using them. Um, and then we have a school Facebook yeah, and we just got onto TikTok. So, all it's right, a- welcome <laughs> to the party. Welcome to the party. Uh, well, we'll put all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Juliet. This was awesome. I'm excited to kind of dive more into your teachings this winter as we all go into hibernation. And uh, thank you for this book. I'm I'm so excited to spend some more time with it. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Maria. That was really fun to connect. And yeah, happy gardening, everyone. All right. Thank you again to Juliet. She is incredible. Uh, We have special links for Juliet's Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine. It's her online school with a variety of herbalism classes. If you're interested on going further, well, if you're interested on going further, you should buy her book, The Healing Garden. That's a great place to start. And then if you want to take the next step and really dive deep into herbalism, you can check out all of the courses that she has to offer, and they're going to be linked in the show notes. At the time I'm recording this, I think we have a special offer. I'm not sure. You'll have to check the show notes to to find out. 
Thanks again to our Garden Party members and to our sponsors. The sponsors help the show get to the air, help me, you know, pay all of my amazing plant lady contractors that help me bring the show to life every week for you. Super exciting episodes coming up, Plant Friends, with some really major announcements. So stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow plant parent personality test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space, off social media, algorithm-free, troll-free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow Radio guest, Leslie Halleck all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like the Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 